Kodak was one of the biggest names in photography. They were innovators in the industry and remained leaders of it for over 100 years. But in January 2012, Kodak filed for bankruptcy. This is a story about the rise and fall of camera giant Kodak. The history of Kodak begins in the 1870s with George Eastman. The 24-year-old bank clerk was planning a vacation from his job in Rochester, New York, when a co-worker suggested that he make photos of his vacation. During its early days, taking photos was very complicated. You needed expensive and heavy equipment, which used bulky plates to capture images, and operating it alone was a difficult job. This led Eastman to seek improvements. He spent three years in his mother's kitchen experimenting with gelatin emulsions, and by 1880, he had invented and patented something called a dry plate coating machine. And in 1881, with the financial backing of businessman Henry Strong, Eastman and Strong became partners and formed the Eastman Dry Plate Company. In 1888, he launched his first camera. Can you guess the name? Yeah, Kodak. I'm sure you've wondered what Kodak means or where it comes from, and the answer is that the name was completely made up by Eastman. The Kodak camera was an instant success. For the first time, anyone could easily take their own pictures. Eastman sold 5,000 Kodaks in just six months and began developing new models. A smart businessman, as well as an inventor, he immediately put money into promoting his new product. Eastman wrote what became one of the first great advertising slogans. You push the button, we do the rest. The immediate triumph of his Kodak camera prompted him to trademark the name Kodak and eventually change his name of his company from Eastman Dry Plate and Film Company to Eastman Kodak Company. While this was happening, fellow inventors Hannibal Goodwin and Emile Renaud were also making amazing advances in photographic technology on their own. They created a transparent nitrocellulose film base and film as well. And in 1889, Eastman combined these ideas with his rolls to invent the first ever mass-produced rolls of transparent photographic film. Almost from the beginning, Eastman wanted to dominate the new market he created. He bought photographic patents held by others and introduced innovative new products. By 1897, a pocket-sized camera with the nitrocellulose film was marketed. But Eastman's crowning achievement would come in the form of the Brownie a cardboard camera that sold for only one dollar, an invention that would overtake the market in massive proportions. Eastman Kodak opened its first overseas plant in London in 1891, and by 1900, it had distribution sites in other European countries. Going into the 20th century, Kodak controlled about 90% of the photography market. One of its greatest developments was Kodachrome, Kodak's name for color film. It was the first successful color film on the market, was available in multiple formats, and enabled beautifully colored magazine photos and colored motion pictures. Success, however, brought legal problems. Hannibal Goodwin had filed a patent for celluloid roll film just before Eastman did, and a long legal battle over who had claimed to the patent came to an end in 1914, when Kodak paid a $5 million settlement. The next year, a federal judge ruled that Kodak was an illegal monopoly controlling too much of the photography industry. The company challenged the decision, but in 1921, Kodak agreed to sell several plants that produced paper and dry plate technology, which were not its most important products. Kodak continued to be the major power in the photography industry, expanding into the new field of home movies and constantly upgrading its film. Kodak enjoyed massive profits, and on July 18, 1930, it was quickly added to the Dow Jones Industrial Average Index, where it remained for over 70 years. In 1932, suffering from a painful spinal disorder, Eastman committed suicide with a bullet to the heart, leaving a note that said, My work is done. Why wait? He left behind a legacy that would endure for generations. Ten years later, Kodak's annual sales in the U.S. alone were $1 billion. The company had just introduced the carousel, a popular automatic slide projector, and in 1962, it began selling the Instamatic camera. The Instamatic introduced a new age of simple amateur photography, just as the first Kodak had 75 years before. By 1970, the company sold 50 million Instamatics. During that decade, Eastman Kodak also entered into the copier business with its Ektaprint machine. 
The copier, however, did not gain much ground in the market as it faced tough competition from industry leaders such as IBM and Xerox. The Ectoprint experiences reflected a growing problem with Kodak. As new technologies were emerging, the company was often slow to adapt them or to take risks with new products developed. Kodak built a video recorder and camera system before such equipment were common, but it feared customers would not accept the high costs. In 1984, Kodak quoted an unnamed industry analyst looking back at that time saying that Kodak was so used to selling $20 cameras that they couldn't believe there was a mass market for $500 machines. In the late 1970s, when VCRs became popular, Kodak didn't have a product to sell. Kodak repeated its copier experience with instant cameras. It waited until 1976 to compete with Polaroid, the pioneer of instant photography. The Kodak camera did not sell well and the company was sued for violating 12 of Polaroid's patents relating to instant photography. Seven Polaroid patents were found to be valid and infringed. Kodak was out of the instant picture market immediately. They stopped selling instant cameras and paid Polaroid almost $1 billion in damages, leaving customers with useless cameras and no film. The Polaroid settlement was part of a string of setbacks during the 1970s and 80s. In the film market, Kodak lost ground to Fuji, a Japanese company. In cameras, cheaper 35mm cameras competed against Kodak products. When the company finally entered the video recorder business, it backed a format that was not compatible with the popular VHS system. Although sales were strong, topping $10 billion in 1983, profits were down. At that time, Kodak was the largest maker of photography and was in the process of diversifying its business. The company had already had a life sciences segment, which the Sterling Acquisitions was intended to boost. Most of these new businesses were not successful, but the Atex and Verbatim deals showed that Kodak was preparing to expand even more into electronic and computers. Before 1975, digital cameras were still unheard of, and that's because Steve Sasson, a young engineer hired at Eastman Kodak, invented digital photography and made the first camera that year. This was more than just a camera, stated Sasson. The camera and the playback system were the beginning of the digital photography era. But the digital revolution did not come easily for Kodak. Sasson made a series of demonstrations to groups of executives from the marketing, technical, and business department, and then to their bosses, and then to their bosses. Their response was unenthusiastic, at best. Kodak's executives were convinced that no one would ever want to look at their pictures on a television set. Print had been with us for over 100 years, no one was complaining about print, and they were very inexpensive. And in 1978, the first digital camera was patented. It was called the electronic still camera. Kodak's marketing department was still not interested in it and told Sasson that they could sell the camera, but wouldn't, because it would eat away at the company's film sales. And as Kodak would eventually find out, the problem was that pretty soon, they wouldn't even be able to sell film. Through the 1990s, Kodak saw sales fall from $20 billion in 1992 to under $14 billion in 2000. During this time, the company went through several changes at the top. In 1993, George M. C. Fisher replaced K. Whitmore as his CEO. At the beginning of 2000, Fisher was replaced by Daniel Karp. In a company statement issued when he took over, Karp said, The picture business today is on the verge of the greatest breakthrough since George Eastman put photography in the hands of consumers. We are changing the ways our customers and consumers can bring new users and meaning to pictures, no matter what the technology. Karp pushed Kodak to a land where his predecessors did not want to go. He shook up a stagnant corporate culture that stifled creativity, replaced almost the entire management team by bringing in outsiders seasoned in digital technologies, and accelerated the shift of manufacturing operating overseas, particularly to China. He put in motion the efforts expected ultimately to sever the direct link with film. He vowed to invest two-thirds of the company's research and development budget on digital projects. The company's sales still steadily fell and between 2000 and 2002 slid from $14.5 billion to $12.8 billion. In the U.S., Eastman Kodak's most important market, sales of photography products, fell nearly 17% between those two years. In 2003, CEO Carp unveiled a new digital-oriented strategy. The plan was to cut costs and conserve cash from the film business, 
plow funds into research and development, booster the consumer business with new digital cameras and printing applications, and push into markets such as commercial on-demand print and medical imaging. CARP followed through, but these changes were just not enough. Eastman Kodak avoided making the massive investments in proprietary developments that could give it an edge, or sealing a truly transformative merger or acquisition. Companies like Dell and Fuji possess one or both of these attributes that Eastman Kodak lacks, the willingness to commit greater resources to research and development and marketing, or the balance sheets and investor confidence to make transformative deals. In 2004, Kodak announced that it would stop selling traditional film cameras in Europe and North America. It was also delisted that year from the Dow Jones Industrial Average Index after being listed for 74 consecutive years. Kodak's cameras were selling, but they weren't making any money, on average losing $60 per camera sold. They were unable to make a camera that was profitable enough to maintain the film division and couldn't compete with its Asian manufacturers like Nikon, Canon, and Sony. Kodak's share in the digital market went from 24% to 15 to 9.6 and eventually to 7%. Times were getting hopeless and Carp realized it was futile and stepped down with Antonio Perez taking over his place. Perez let go of 27,000 employees, outsourced a lot of the manufacturing, and decided to aim towards the printing business that supposedly was a high margin market. In 2007, the company made a huge mistake in selling off its health imaging business for $2.35 billion, which was meant to go towards its consumer camera business. Unfortunately, health imaging had been good to Kodak. It also happened to be the last year that Kodak turned an annual profit. By 2008, the digital camera market was already starting to decline. A new technology emerged. 120 million camera phones were in use just in the U.S. alone. People shifted from printing pictures to posting them on social media and mobile phone apps. Another thing that Kodak missed out on. So in 2012, they abandoned the printing market altogether. With no money, Kodak was desperate. They sold their portfolio and looked to make a profit through patent lawsuits. But losses kept piling on and the millions vanished quickly. Analysts suggested that the company declare bankruptcy, which they did and Citibank came to the rescue with $950 million and 18 months to reorganize. They did decide on one thing, they would stop making cameras. 